First of all, congratulations to Dr. Tom Osborne, the distinguished alumni for the College of Education and Human Sciences for 2013. It's very nice to have you with us today. Well, thanks, Larry. Good to be here. Good. We have a short interview, um, and I know you've been through a number of these, so I, I don't think there's anything here that will surprise you. But first, uh, a little bit about you and your background in history that we may or may not know. You've enjoyed a very uh, exceptional career in college coaching, college administration, been a member of Congress. Where did this career path begin? How did it unfold? And uh, where do you see yourself going now? Okay. Well, <clears throat> I went to Hastings College and spent a little time in the uh, NFL, three years, and then had a injury situation which meant that I really couldn't play anymore. And uh, so I had always thought that maybe I wanted to go into college administration. So I came back to the University of Nebraska and uh, enrolled in educational psychology. But I also realized that athletics had been uh, a huge part of my life and I thought maybe I'd try to ease away from it. And uh, Bob Devaney had just been hired from Wyoming as the football coach, and I actually wrote to him out at Wyoming because he hadn't arrived here yet and asked him if uh, he could use a graduate assistant football coach. And um, so he uh, said, well, he wasn't sure he needed any coach, but there was a situation over in Sella Quadrangle where he had a number of players that he'd heard were kind of running the, the, the whole show and they wouldn't, they had thrown the dorm counselors out of the area and they, and they were, they were in charge, and uh, he wanted me to move in with him, and if, if so, then I would uh, get room and board on the, uh, or get bored, I guess, just on the training table. So I, I moved in over there, and, and then eventually did uh, that spring, started coaching, and one thing led to another, and even though I taught, and I uh, finished my master's and my PhD, when it came time finally to decide which way you're gonna go, I just couldn't quite break away from athletics and uh, became an assistant coach and uh, decided I'd give it seven years. And uh, if I wasn't a head coach by that time, I'd go back into academia. And uh, about that time, Bob decided to step aside. And uh, so one thing led to another. And it was really an uncharted area. I didn't really plan to have it develop like it did, but. Uh, uh, I guess I, in many ways I'm glad it did work out that way. So the rest of us are as well. What, um, what was it that drew you to the masters in Ed Psych and the, eventually the PhD in Ed Psych? Mm -hmm. Well, as I said, I, I had planned to go into college administration work and I, I thought that was a pretty good avenue. I had been a, um, had a minor in, in psychology as an undergraduate. Okay and a history major, and I think a political science uh, major, and so, but I was always interested in psychology, and, uh, and really I, I would have to say that the uh, Ed Psych background helped me quite a bit in coaching. I guess your education always par is part of you, mm -hmm. and uh, whether you, it wasn't like I was flipping pages in my mind and as I dealt with players, but I think to some degree it was helpful. Good. You've uh, observed and participated in many changes throughout your distinguished mm -hmm. career. What changes have you seen that really give you hope? And what kind of changes are you seeing or have seen that uh, are cause for concern? Mm -hmm. Just in general, yeah. changes in general. Well, I guess if you look at the world of athletics, the, the changes that have given me some hope is that uh, there's, a, there's certainly been a lot of academic reform. At one time, it was possible for a, a player to remain eligible and uh, play for four years and, and yet uh, uh, take a hodgepodge of courses where you just needed a, a C average. And, and uh, so maybe they'd have 40 hours to counter toward a degree and yet they would have been in school in four, four years. And, uh, so now with uh, academic progress report and all those kinds of things, you, you really can't do that anymore. So, and, and I think the, the growth of academic support systems and some uh, standardized tests, ACT, SAT, 
requirements, which uh, in some ways don't always measure what they should, but still, it's uh, at least a, a standard where you have a pretty good idea that somebody can do college work before they're allowed to come here on a scholarship. So those things are good. I, I think also uh, in athletics, um, enforcement, even though uh, athletics continues to get a black eye, there's a lot more integrity in college athletics. There's a lot less rule violation than there used to be. So those things are all good. On the other hand, has been uh, what I would call the breakdown of the family. When I first started uh, coaching back in the early 60s, um, we seldom saw somebody that wasn't from an intact family. Mm -hmm. If uh, somebody only had one parent, it was usually because one parent or the other was deceased. And uh, I had never heard of methamphetamine or cocaine, um, some alcohol abuse, but that was about it. Hadn't really heard much about any, any gang activity. And, uh, and then as time went on, uh, I saw more and more kids coming into our program and more and more kids just nationally who were from really difficult circumstances. And uh, today, I think 50% of our young people are growing up without both biological parents, which means that they've probably suffered some fairly considerable trauma at one time or another in their life. So. And, and the reason this concerns me is I, I think that uh, it's very difficult to have a stable society if you don't have young people that are well grounded and, and have a sense of values and, and a sense of discipline. And um, so this is why um, my wife and I have spent a lot of time with a teammates mentoring program. Can't always legislate good families, but we can at least provide a caring adult in their lives, which is important. True. Yeah, the, I think the, the grounding is essential. And mm -hmm. I think even outside of athletics, we see a lot of kids who are not very well. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, it's all uh, over the place. Yeah, it's just uh, pretty much nationwide and a lot of unhealthy influences. Yeah, I think even worldwide, uh, there's a struggle across the world to, mm -hmm. to ground people a little bit better. Right. Um, I know that a lot of people seek advice from you and you've given counsel to people both on career paths and uh, futures, uh, certainly your players. I know you've educated your players as, about mm -hmm. futures and how to be prepared. Um, what kind of guidance do you offer people who might come to you and want to teach or coach or go on in their profession? Mm -hmm. Well, I, if somebody wants to be a teacher or coach, I, I'm always somewhat um, encouraging and optimistic. Uh, uh, for most of them, uh, the pay will not be exceptional. And, uh, but I think the rewards are, are, are exceptional because um, you're able to connect with so many people over so many years. And, um, so to me, one of the, the great things about coaching hasn't been, you know, uh, wards, championships, wh whatever it may be. It's really the relationships, and there's hardly a week go goes by that I don't hear from one or two or three players, you know, uh, just touching base on, on some issue. So in a sense, you uh, end up with not just uh, tens of children, but uh, hundreds and probably in some cases thousands who are almost like your own family. And um, so those relationships, I think, are very strong, very powerful. And so uh, there's really not much more meaningful profession that I can think of than somebody who uh, does go into the teaching and or coaching profession. And uh, uh, unfortunately, in our country, Sometimes we don't recognize and reward teachers as they do in Europe and other places where they, they recognize the full worth of a great teacher. True, I just, and you probably saw this too, the Philadelphia schools have laid off um, hundreds of teachers, counselors, administrators. Los Angeles, I believe, just laid off 4,000 to meet a budget. Mm. And um, that means that kids will probably be left out of some opportunities that they may have once had. Well, and, and uh, yeah, if, I think our, our culture needs to place 
a proper premium, proper perspective on the value of a teacher because with so many family dysfunctions, breakdowns, in many cases, the only, only person who fills that gap is a, is a teacher, is a coach. And, uh, and so there's, there's way more responsibility uh, put on teachers and coaches than there ever has been in the past. True. And uh, there's never been a greater need. And, uh, and yet, as you mentioned, sometimes uh, we don't seem to see and uh, provide a proper perspective. And uh, so <clears throat> we continue to build more prisons mm -hmm. and hire more police officers and all these things are necessary, but we're, we're not doing enough on the prevention side and we're treating symptoms at the back end and they are very expensive and oftentimes at that point uh, things are not very sal salvageable. You know, um, having come out of high school ranks and been a superintendent and a principal, I worked a lot with coaches. And they really do get to see um, the whole youngster as they coach that person. They, they both have him in the classroom and then uh, on the field or on the court. What kind of background do you look for in that coaching staff that you would hire or that you would hope somebody else would hire? Well, Larry, I think the first thing I would look for is probably the most um, difficult thing to assess, and that would be character. Uh, well, is this person a, a person of integrity? Uh, are they uh, a person who is capable of caring about another person, are, are they egocentric, or are they people who are servant leaders? And um, so sometimes in a one hour or two hour interview, or by simply contacting uh, references, you can sometimes get a, a flavor, you can get an idea. But oftentimes until you've actually been around that person for six months or a year, right. you really don't know for sure. And uh, but I always felt that uh, if we had a person with good character, cared about players, good work ethic, um, we could teach them to coach. And mm -hmm. um, so I, I hired guys, uh, maybe a guy was a secondary coach and, and we needed a receiver coach, but if, if I felt he had really good character and uh, was interested in kids and interested in football, we, we could teach him to be a receiver coach and, or vice versa. And uh, so uh, probably that was the number one issue. But, and character is hard to build after the fact. That it has is, to be yeah. present all the time. Yeah, I remember Tom Landry one time told me that uh, he didn't feel that he'd ever had a player where he had any substantial impact on their character. Hmm. Because he got them after they were 22, 23, 24 years old. Yeah. Now that's not true of a uh, high school coach or to some degree a college coach. I, I would have to say that, yeah, I, I, I got a lot of guys that were 17, 18 years old, and by the time they were 22, I saw some changes, and usually for the better, sometimes for the worse, but uh, um, coaches certainly have an impact on, on character. They sure do. I know you've worked with a lot of young people throughout your career, and in the uh, business of education, there are some people who say, uh, young people are different today than they were in the 70s or the 80s. Mm -hmm. um, how do you view that statement? Are kids different uh, today? Well, uh, I suspect they are to some degree. I, uh, I know I get, if I get on a team bus here recently or a, an airplane, um, people have their headphones on mm -hmm. and, uh, and they may be texting each other five or ten feet away, there's not a lot of personal dialogue. And uh, so sometimes people are isolated by technology, and so they're on Facebook and they're on YouTube and they're texting and they're Twittering and all those kinds of things. But probably not much as much interpersonal relationship and uh, a, you know, what we might call emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I think in that respect, kids may be a little bit different today. I think there's still an awful lot of kids out there. There's a lot of kids with a lot of information. I mean, they're, 
uh, I guess in a more or less classic sense, we would say they're intelligent. Mm -hmm. um, kids, I think, today probably are a little more impatient. They want, uh, they don't want a job so much as they want a position sometimes, and they want to rise to the top very quickly. And, um, and of course, in our society today, maybe just getting a good job and working hard at it and, uh, you know, uh, trying to come up through the ranks is uh, something that may, may not be appreciated as much as it once was. You mentioned hard work. <clears throat> and I think probably when you and I grew up, that was a message we got from our parents. Work hard, mm -hmm. keep your nose clean, and wait, because it's going to take some time. Is, is hard work um, a requirement in today's world? I mean, um, you mentioned kids want to get a position, not a job. They want mm -hmm. to rise to the top quickly. How do we get them to understand that working hard or working smart is mm -hmm. still important? Well, again, I, I think so often that comes from a family grounding. You know, I, I, know, I know my dad, um, that was just part of the deal. You know, and I started mowing lawns when I was 12 years old, and it was a hand mower, and <laughs> then I worked construction and all those kinds of things. And, and, of course, kids in a farm background, for the most part, have done chores, and they, and they do those kind of things. Uh, technology has removed a lot of the physical manual labor that we once did. But I think kids do are, those who are conscious of good grades, uh, high ACT scores, and those, they, they probably work pretty hard in those areas. It's more intellectual rather than physical work. And, um, and so I, I can't say that there is no work ethic. I think there is, but uh, it's probably just a little bit different. Because we were, we were probably more on the manual labor yeah, side of things. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I know a lot of schools have um, community involvement projects for their seniors. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an encouraging sign that kids can volunteer right. and uh, have a senior project that involves volunteerism and work, hard work. Yeah. So, Well, we, uh, in the athletic department, uh, we have something called life skills. So every team has at least two life skills projects where they uh, devote themselves to some activity in the community. It may be mentoring, it could be uh, speaking in elementary schools, middle schools, it could be visiting hospitals. And, and so um, sometimes athletics can be all about me, can be kind of self-absorbed, which is somewhat typical of our culture. And uh, we really feel it's very important uh, that people understand that to live a productive and a happy life. Uh, you, you better be giving yourself to, to other people, to, other, to a cause that maybe is larger than yourself. So uh, we try to make that part of the deal. That's good. I, I remember when the life skills program was implemented and I thought that was a great move. Mm -hmm. You've um, given a lot of speeches over your lifetime and certainly in the last few years. In my opinion, you've always left people with more information uh, that they should have than they had before they came in, and you've underlined certain points in your speeches. What's the one consistent message or two consistent messages that you always try to get across in your addresses to business people, coaches, educators, the community? Well, of course, every, every speech is to a different audience, so... <laughs> I try not to be just a one-note uh, musician, <laughs> but uh, more recently, I'm spending most of my time uh, with teammates, and um, and so I'm trying to recruit mentors, and I'm, I'm trying to convince people that uh, investing in the life of a young person, first of all, isn't rocket science. You know that uh, if you're capable of carrying on a conversation of carrying. And I use the term agape, which is a biblical term, <clears throat> which means uh, unconditional positive regard. You, you will the best for another person. Even if that person may, on a given day, may be prickly or somewhat unlovable, you can, you can still will the best for them. You can want the best outcome. Make sure they, they get the best education they can, that they're emotionally grounded and, and that they know that you care. And uh, if you do that, sometimes you provide young person something that uh, they're they're not receiving any other place 
And so we find that mentoring can be very powerful. And I guess uh, if, if it was just one theme, it's generally that investing in other people, whether it be as a coach, as a boss, you know, we have leadership, which we'd call transformational leadership, which is primarily servant leadership. And uh, so often people who are coaches or bosses or people in authority tend to feel that uh, it's my way or the highway, it's top down, and I'm, I'm doing all the talking, I'm not listening, and, and uh, there's another way to, to lead people. And, uh, and uh, if they know that you really care about them, that you're there to serve them, I think it makes all the difference. Yep, I agree. You mentioned teammates, and teammates seems to be growing and growing and growing. Mm -hmm. um, are there more people volunteering to become mentors than you would imagine, or is it about as you had hoped? Well, there, there's never enough, mm -hmm. but we, um, we did start with 22 football players in 1991, and today we're at about 6,500 uh, wow. across 125 communities in Nebraska and into Iowa. And uh, we're aiming to get to 10,000 in about another two years. So we always have about a third more kids in a school who want a mentor than we have mentors. And um, it's amazing, you go to a school and maybe you see your mentee and other kids will come up and say, you know, uh, would you be my mentor? I, I would really like a mentor. And um, I think the White House did a survey of um, young people who were 16 to 24 years of age. And these were kids who had dropped out of school and uh, who didn't have a job. And uh, they asked them, if you had one thing in your life, one, one wish that would be fulfilled, what would it be? And uh, the most common answer, I think 68% of them said that it was uh, to have a, an adult in their life who could show them the way. Mm. Um, you'd think it would be a computer, a cell phone, a car, uh, some money, you know, but uh, so the kids that were really struggling, were having hard times, uh, apparently felt that they had really lacked somebody in their life uh, an adult person that could kind of give them some guidance. And so we'd like to try to short circuit that process if we can. And you bet. starting with age, you know, third, fourth, fifth grade kids and on through high school into college to give them a mentor. How long does a mentor <coughs> typically stay with a young person? Well, we, we ask for at least a year's commitment, but uh, we'd like to start in the third or fourth grade and stay with them on, on through uh, uh, high, graduation from high school. Oh, that'd be great. And also get them into some type of post-secondary education. Because a high school diploma today is is the minimum, but you know you probably need a community college, a, a trade school, a four-year uh, mm -hmm. degree, something beyond high school. And um, the average match is about 34 months. Oh. And that includes all those who are are, are just starting. So. We're adding a lot of mentors, but we have an awful lot of mentors who have been with their young person for five, six, seven, eight years, and that's, that's, great. that's the ideal. And if you can start that relationship fairly early, third, fourth, fifth grade, you usually build a pretty strong bond. So when, when the middle school and the high school years come, you can kind of weather those storms. Yeah, that's 34 months is good. I mean, that, well, as the an average. Yeah, the national average is less than one year. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, Pretty cost effective. It's about four hundred fifty dollars per year per match, and nationally uh, the average is between one and two thousand oh, dollars per year per match. So Very we're effective. trying to trying to reach as many kids as we can and as cost effectively as we can. Great. Mm -hmm. Well, congratulations on that success and growing teammates and yeah. continuing to grow teammates. We'll keep, we'll keep working at it. Good. Uh, that's the end of our formal questions. Is, is there anything you would like to add, anything you would like us to know about you or your work or your future um, that might be good for our alumni? Uh -huh. Well, not particularly. Uh, certainly Nancy has been a, a, a great uh, life partner and she uh, we've been married for 51 years and she is a product of the uh, Teachers College College of Education at the University. 
and she was a teacher for three or four years until we tar started having our family and until I, until I got <laughs> involved in coaching, and, which was pretty much all consuming. And uh, so um, certainly family is important. And, uh, and I guess that's the thing that we probably take more pride in than anything is just our kids and our grandkids. And we're like everybody who, uh, you know, has, has a family. So Good. Mm -hmm. Tom Osborne, thank okay. you very much for being our guest. Thanks, Larry. You're welcome.